Thanks, Richard. That was pretty uh, overly generous. Uh, in fact, I fear that it's going to be like, the, you know how some people thought Twin Peaks season three was pretty terrible? I think that's probably going to be uh, the result. But anyway, uh, I, I, I do want to say thanks to Stefan and, and Jamie. It was really uh, it's been great, and, and thanks for inviting me, and thanks for, for coming. And I do want to also say something about what Carol said about the notion of Lynch as bizarrely normal, because um, so I was in... 1998, I was, for my sins, I was condemned to teach in the, in Texas, which I, you might not know here, but that's not a place you want to, you want to be. And, uh, and some, a colleague, it was nice of her, she invited me and my spouse to dinner, and she said, well, uh, what filmmakers do you like? And I said, ah, oh, David Lynch. And, and she said, well, what would you, she goes, I just think he's so bizarre. I just, I said, well, okay, that changes things. Uh, uh, and, 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 and I said, well, no, I, I would call him bizarrely normal. And she looked at me, she got very upset. And she said, you know, there is nothing bizarre about normality. And I said, okay. And then I just ate my dinner and then I never talked to her again. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so, uh, but now it seems like you can say normal. I mean, I guess she's dead now, but, um, <laughs> not because of that. It's just old. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and I didn't kill her either. Uh, but uh, 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 if she had lived, I don't think she lived to see the president of the United States, but I think she would have then said, I think, okay, you can say the normal is now bizarre. Anyway, um, so I think one of the clear, I'm, so I'm going to talk about um, season three almost exclusively, and and uh, I, I am going to focus on a couple of things that seem might seem minor, but I want to. I'm going to try to make the contention that they're really major, and I want to sort of base my reading on them. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, one of the clearest clues I think that Lynch provides about making sense of Twin Peaks: The Return is, at the same time, completely unremarkable and almost unnoticeable. So, in Fire Walk with Me, Lynch locates the Fat Trout Trailer Park in the town of Deer Meadow, Washington, in the southwestern part of the state. If you remember, this is the first like 30 minutes of the film. The Chris Isaac section. This is the town where Leland Palmer killed Teresa Banks before she attempted to blackmail him. In the third season of the series, the one that we just saw, the Fat, trail, the fat Trout Trailer Park, now that with the term new affixed to its name, is in a different part of the state, uh, of the state in Twin Peaks. The manager, Carl Rod, uh, played by Harry Dean Stanton, who works at the trailer park in Deer Meadow, has traveled with it to Twin Peaks, so now he's a resident of Twin Peaks. This relocation has caused some confusion among fans of the series and even one creator of the show, as Mark Frost claims that it never moved at all in the secret history of Twin Peaks when it seems to me clear it had to have moved. Uh, and to most people, I think. Uh, but relocating the fat trail, trout trailer park uh, to Twin Peaks serves as a clue that Twin Peaks is not what it was before. It now resembles Deer Meadow much more than the Twin Peaks of the first two seasons. In Deer Meadow, unlike in the Twin Peaks of the first two seasons, one constantly confronts the opacity of the other. No one is welcoming, nor provides any answers to the questions that one poses. Even if you watch the special extended version of Fire Walk with me, it's not like it's, oh, it's all clear now about Deer Meadow. It's the fact that it's Maybe even less clear. Uh, no one offers one hot cherry, uh, hot coffee, uh, cherry pie to visitors as they do in Twin Peaks. When FBI agents Chester Desmond and Sam Stanley investigate the murder of Terry, Teresa Banks in Deer Meadow, they encounter nothing but obfuscation and silence. Even from the local police who are supposed to uh, assist them in law enforcement, one would think. It appears to be a town completely bereft of enjoyment as suggested by the contrast between the sparse and unappealing Haps Diner there and the welcoming Double R Diner in Twin Peaks. If you'll remember, the, 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 the waiter at, the, at, the, at Haps Diner says, you want to hear about our specials? And then they say, sure. And she says, we ain't got any. So it's, <laughs> it's a, it's, it's, that's a sort of the, sums up Deer Meadow in a, in a nutshell. So the Deer Meadow portion of Fire Walk With Me in the first 30 minutes of the film reflects a world that leaves spectators stuck desiring without any phantasmatic resolution to that desire. The same situation confronts the spectator of Twin Peaks The Return, except 
rather than enduring only 30 minutes, it lasts almost 18 episodes. So it's, it's like we're stuck in the first 30 minutes of Fire Walk With Me for a long time. Uh, though the double R has not become as bleak as Haps, it has spawned franchises, so it's no longer this quaint little double R. Uh, what's more, however, is the way the third season figures Twin Peaks as a site of inexplicable obscurity. The season begins in the White Lodge with the firemen, formerly known as the Giants, the same figure, addressing Agent Dale Cooper and telling him, listen to the sounds. After he says this, an indecipherable scratching sound appears from an old gramophone on the table. The fireman follows up this by stating, it's in our house now, it cannot be said aloud now, remember 430, Richard and Linda, Dale responds, I understand. Which certainly doesn't speak for the spectator, who is undoubtedly bewildered at this point, at least I was at this point. I think most were. Uh, after the fireman tells Dale that he is, a, he is far away, Dale disappears, and the scene switches to the normal reality of Twin Peaks, where Dr. Jaco Jacoby, become Dr. Amp, receives a shipment of shovels. Uh, though we eventually learn the purpose of the shovels, that actually isn't very complex, the mystery of what the fireman tells Dale endures throughout the season. There's no reason why it cannot all be said aloud now, as he says, except that this mystery sets up the desire of the spectator by setting up a point of unknowing. The fireman establishes a mystery for the sake of establishing a mystery, one that is resolved in the final episode when Dale and Diane, played by Laura Dern, travel 430 miles, check into a hotel to have sex, seemingly only to have sex, and wake up the next morning, apparently transformed into Richard and Linda, at least according to the note, that Diane leaves for Dale, which is addressed to Richard from Linda. At this point, the references from the fireman's mysterious initial statement become clear, but the resolution isn't a happy one at all. Realizing the desire that begins the season doesn't lead to the salvation of Laura Palmer or the defeat of the supposedly negative force of Judy. Instead, it leaves Dale and the spectator stuck in a repetition that recreates the very force that attempts to destroy. So I think uh, Twin Print Peaks, The Return, is a, a show about... This, the way repetition sort of trumps our attempts to heroically act in its stead. So Twin Peaks, The Return, leaves us stuck as spectators in the position of the desiring subject with only a momentary glimpse of a resolution to that desire. Not only do bizarre and probably ultimately inexplicable events constantly take place, but even the central char character of the series, Dale Cooper, doesn't know who he is throughout most of the running time of the season. After, 25, after the 25 years pass, and Dale is set to return to his earthly existence and take the place of the evil do doppelganger, Mr. C. He's referred to in various ways, if you read anything. So, Bad Cooper, but I, I think Mr. C is the, is the one that most people have chosen, uh, who replaced him. Mr. C refuses to return to the lodge and cede his place to Dale. So, this is the sort of dynamic that's taking place in the series. As a result, Dale cannot just directly enter back into existence. Instead, he replaces the replica, or tulpa, that had taken his place, Dougie Jones. But Dale enters without any conscious knowledge of who he is or even how to interact with others in the world. And some people have said that, that Dougie, we were seeing him sort of go through the mirror stage, and, sort of, and I don't think that makes sense, although that's not what I'm going to talk about. Uh, the greatest frustration among spectators of Twin Peaks, The Return, uh, surrounds the character of Dougie, at least all of my friends that watch the show. Uh, he's unable to formulate his own words, really, or to act on his own, but can repeat what he said. Uh, when he first emerges, he wins 30 large jackpots at the slot machines of the Silver Mustang Casino. <laughs> it's funny just to even say it. Uh, I don't have to show it, I can just say it. Uh, uh, there's clearly no skill involved, the opposite. Uh, he barely knows how to pull the lever and fails to try to collect his winnings as they pour out from the sh machines. I thought this was a, a nice uh, sort of semi-illusion to Psycho where you're, as a spectator, you see the money laying and you're like to Norman, oh, don't forget to take the money uh, after you've killed her. Uh, and I felt like to say, I kept saying, get the money out of the machine, what are you doing? And I'm like a person who, who disdains capitalism, but I'm like, get the money. Uh, so I thought that was pretty great. Um, Anyway, so, so uh, uh, things don't improve when he goes home to his family of Janie E., Naomi Watts, and I thought uh, uh, 
Carol was great to say, when she said the great Naomi Watts, I mean, right, she's the, she's the greatest. Uh, I found myself, even when I watched the series the first time, and I was slowly, it was hard to get into, I'm like, well, at least Naomi Watts is in it, and she's just terrific. Uh, so he goes home to the family of Naomi Watts and Sonny Jim, and there's, he's really not connecting with them, <laughs> to say the least. Um, there's no gradual emergence of Dale Cooper from Dougie, so we don't, as we might expect, like we might see, okay, we're getting a little, he's coming around, he's coming around, he's becoming more Cooper. Doesn't happen. One watches for him episode after episode, waiting for Cooper to emerge, but we're trapped as a spectator in this constant sense of disappointment. There are moments that, that trigger Dale, however. When an assassin like Ike Stadler surprises him and tries to kill him, Dale instinctively distend, defends himself and subdues his attacker, so it's clear that's there's some Cooper evidence. His wherewithal shocks Janie E., who treats him like a hapless, uh, helpless toddler most of the time. Dale, uh, sorry, Lynch leaves Dale in the helpless Dougie state for so long, I think, in order to enhance the spectator's desire for Agent Cooper to return. At least this is my sense, and I think most people show this, that you're constantly saying, like, when's Cooper coming back? And he doesn't for a long time. And, and in this way, I think the fantasy of FBI agent Dale Cooper as the heroic figure of salvation animates the return. Like that's the thing driving that the series. And the persistence of Dougie actually kind of nurtures this fantasy. The first two seasons of Twin Peaks, until the solution of Laura Palmer's murder, develop Laura as the ultimate fantasy object. Then Fire Walk With Me explodes this fantasy by showing the world from the perspective of the fantasy object herself. And I, and I liked what Jamie said about the way in which it's... Um, it's, you know, like, that's a, that's a really well, like, it's hard to imagine a more well-rounded character, I think, than, than Laura Palmer in, in Fire Walk With Me, or a more real character. Uh, but Fire Walk With Me leaves intact, I think, the figure of Agent Cooper in the fantasy of Twin Peaks. That is, the one who might save Laura, at least posthumously, from male sexual violence. So there's this, there's this phantasmatic figure of Cooper left over from Fire Walk With Me, and that's in existence at the beginning of The Return, and that's what The Return is, is playing on. So The Return does return to the figure of Agent Cooper. Uh, I'm sorry. The Return does to the figure of Agent Cooper what Fire Walk With Me does to Laura. That is, it reveals that in his effort to rescue Laura and the efforts of men like him, this is actually part of the violence done to her, not a remedy for it. Rather than providing salvation, he actually exacerbates the problem. So to put it in the contemporary parlance, this might be an American way, and I, so I apologize, but this is, a, this is kind of an NRA, National Rifle Association, ad campaign. The good guy with the gun, this is the Lynchian version, the good guy with the gun is the hidden support of the bad guy with the gun rather than the remedy or necessary counterweight. Uh, See, if I would have said that in America, people would have been really laughing. But <laughs> so it just it didn't. So it does prove uh, the point that uh, jokes are personal. As my, I was going to say, my two boy, fourteen year old twins, and they 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 never laugh. And I said like, they're like, do you do people actually laugh at you? I'm like, they do, and they're like, oh my god, no one, they don't have a sense of humor. Uh, so I do think that jokes are unfortunately personal. I would like this theory that they're universal and that, you know, if you tell the good joke, like everyone just, they're compelled to laugh. They can't help themselves. But I, unfortunately, I don't think that's true. Uh, though we wait for Dale Cooper to emerge throughout almost the entire season, the final two episodes actually re reveal the nefariousness of this fantasy figure. But in order to show the ultimate deleterious effect of Agent Cooper, Lynch first builds up our desire for his emergence and then gives a full phantasmatic weight to his initial appearance as himself. I have to admit, I was even incredibly moved by this. Uh, hospitalized after electrocuting himself when he hears the name Gordon Cole while watching Sunset Boulevard on television in episode 16, all of a sudden Dougie comes out of his coma and reveals himself to be Dale Cooper. And this is one of the few times in the series, I think it's the third time that, that Lynch uses the Twin Peaks theme, which... In, 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 in the first two seasons, it's, it's ubiquitous, and even in Fire Walk With Me, it's, it's relatively ubiquitous, which uh, he usually uses to, to, to mark, I think, this moment of like phantasmatic enjoyment that's, that's sort of out transcendent. Um, this is the, and I, I think this return of Cooper is actually the return that the title of the series alludes to. The spectator enjoys the long-awaited return of Agent Cooper as the phantasmatic resolution of the desire that the entire season has established. 
You're a fine man, Bushnell Mullins. I will not soon forget your kindness and decency. What about the FBI? I am the FBI. All right. Uh, so, uh, as Dale walks out of the hotel, so, so the spectator, I think, enjoys this long-awaited return of Agent Cooper as the phantasmatic resolution of the desire that the entire season has established. Even I, I have to say that I was... I, I even confessed to crying when he said, I am the FBI. And I, I, don't, even, I don't even like the FBI. I, I'm against the FBI. Uh, I'm more against the FBI than Trump is. So, uh, uh, <laughs> which is pretty, he's pretty against. Um, as Dale walks out of the ho his hospital room, Dougie's boss, Bushnell Mullins, asks him, what about the FBI? Lynch cuts to the medium shot of Dale, who responds, I am the FBI. And it's right at this moment that we get the Twin Peaks swelling especially loud uh, to create this sense of salvation that's finally arrived. This is the first, I think, truly phantasmatic moment in the season. And it's an indirect contrast to the first two where uh, these kind of moments are, are populating it throughout. Dale's return is not the end of the fantasy, however. The fantasy further includes the prevention of Laura Palmer's murder, the defeat of the, of the figure of phallic enjoyment Bob, and the attempted triumph over the enigmatic negative force of Judy. The, the ultimate dream of the law is to prevent crimes before they happen rather than investigating them after the fact. The most effective police force would eliminate the need for its own policing power if it could do away with criminality before criminality comes into existence. Unfortunately, this dream requires the nightmare of a total surveillance state that would be worse than the crimes that such a state would prevent. Many films actually deal with this nightmare and reveal its ramifications, like Vim Vender's, I think, underrated End of Violence and Steven Spielberg's, maybe overrated, but I, it's fine, uh, Minority Report. In these films, the surveillance necessary uh, for the prevention of the crime creates an inhospitable social order that proves not worth the cost, in both cases. Uh, in Twin Peaks, The Return, Dale Cooper does not resort to set, such mechanisms like total surveillance or predicting future crimes to ward off a murder. Instead, he returns to the past and actually alters it directly. Using the key to his former room at the Great Northern Hotel, Dale returns to the night of the murder of Laura Palmer, uh, indicating that, uh, that Dale looks on from the perspective of the future. We see the events depicted in color in Fire and Walk With Me transpire in black and white in, here in, in The Return. Laura sneaks out of her house to James, to, to James Hurley waiting on his motorcycle, and when they stop and talk and profess their love for each other, Dale appears in the distance. Just after his appearance, this is a great moment, I think, Laura screams as she glimpses him in the, in the woods. Although in the, when you're watching it in Firewalk with me, you have no idea that, of course, Lynch probably didn't know, that it's Cooper that uh, she sees. Uh, although she likely assumes that it's Bob, it's Dale, who has come to her, her rescue rather than to assault her. But I want to say... Uh, She's right to even scream, even though he's coming to her rescue. Okay. Um, after Laura leaves James at the stoplight, just like in Fire Walk with me, the, the logic is the same. Uh, she walks through the woods to the cabin where Leo, Jacques, and Renette await. But Dale interrupts her. When he takes her hand, the ermin, the, at the, that precise moment, the image turns from black and white to color. He tells her that he's taking her home which, given the treatment she's received from her father, cannot possibly mean the Palmer household, right? I mean, it can't, can't mean that. Or she would be like, let my hand go. I'd rather see uh, Leo and Jacques. Uh, as they begin to walk hand in hand, Lynch cuts to the events of the next morning. So we see Pete Martell go fishing as he would the day he finds Laura's body. But we see the body wrapped in plastic actually disappear on the shore, indicating that Dale has successfully altered history and saved Laura from Bob. Rather than cut directly to Cooper's rescue attempt, the show inter interposes, interestingly here, a scene of Sarah Palmer grabbing Laura's portrait off the table, thrusting it to the ground, and repeatedly stabbing it with a broken bottle. The scene of her stabbing the portrait with the bottle appears fractured. It's, it's sort of out, of out of joint. It repeats the same, and it also repeats. It repeats the same shot again and again while drawing clear attention to the fragmented editing. Clearly, Sarah acts in a manner similar to Leland when he is Bob, although she's not raping Laura, she's performing a kind of existential violence on her. The evidence that Sarah is not just attacking Laura's portrait, but Laura herself, occurs in the next scene. When Lynch cuts back to Dale leading Laura through the woods, all of a sudden we see Laura's hand vanish from Dale's. 
as a scratching sound that from the same from the same sound we heard with the giant or the fireman uh, in the first episode occurs on the audio track. One moment Laura's there, next moment she's gone. Just after her disappearance as Dale looks for her, we hear her scream in horror as the camera pans across the empty woods. Dale succeeds in rescuing Laura from death at the hands of her father, only to serve her up to some other malevolent force. And in the final episode, Dale and Diane embark on a mysterious plan that leads them to cross into another reality after they travel 430 miles. So now all of a sudden the fireman's prophecies are, are making a little more sense. In this reality, Dale becomes transformed perhaps into the figure of Richard named by the fireman. He's more aggressive and less the pure phantasmatic figure than he was when he initially returned, like in this scene. He finds himself in Odessa, Texas, where he locates a woman who looks like Laura Palmer, named Carrie Page, also played by Cheryl Lee. Uh, he drives to Texas, he drives her to, from Texas to Twin Peaks, uh, where they go to her house that she doesn't recognize and that doesn't contain her parents. But it has all sorts of allusions to the Twin Peaks uh, universe and the people that lived there and that are living there. Um, when returning to the street in front of the house, after finding someone else living there, Dale kind of stumbles and then he, he asks Carrie, what year is it? Just afterward, just after he says this, a soft voice upstairs in the house is Laura, which prompts Carrie Page to scream, and then the show ends with a cut to black. Though it isn't at all clear what violence Dale has introduced Laurie slash Carrie to, it is clear he hasn't saved her, but actually rather helped to repeat her trauma. Snatching her away prior to her murder prevents one trauma, but it also has the effect of unleashing another. The problem with Agent Cooper's quest is not that he's trying to lessen the suffering in the world. Yeah. It's not that he's trying to lessen the suffering in the world. The problem then lies instead with his belief that he can eliminate trauma as such or rid the world of its negative force or negativity. That he thinks, I can, if I can just get rid of negativity itself, then Laura will be okay and the world will be better. Trauma actually, negativity, constitutes the subject as subject. So to eliminate trauma before it occurs, or to eliminate all negative force in the universe, is to attempt to do away with subjectivity as such, which is why it always ends up producing an additional trauma rather than alleviating trauma. So I, I, I'm thinking here of uh, this idea of Herbert Marcuse of, of surplus repression. He's like, there's a certain necessary repression, and then if you try to eliminate that, you get a surplus. And I think that's true of, of trauma too. There's like a surplus trauma if you try to get rid of the constitutive, eliminate all trauma altogether. This is why, I think, Lynch uses Twin Peaks The Return to expose the damage done by the Agent Cooper fantasy. Now I want to turn to a, to a sort of happier note. Uh, though it plays a minor part in the overall structure, in other words, I, I mean, I don't want to just turn because I like happy endings, but, um, but because I think it's often, um, I hear people say like, okay, Lynch shows what we shouldn't do, but is there any point at which he shows what we, what we should be doing? And so I think there is a kind of way in which the return actually does show that. And that's why I want to turn this. It's a, kind of a minor thing, but I think important nonetheless. So it plays a minor part in the overall structure, but there's one narrative thread in season three that has a kind of conventional conclusion and actually shows characters able to break out of a destructive repetition and enter maybe a, a kind of normally negative repetition. This is the relationship between Big, Big Ed and Norma. Having lived with a thwarted love for decades because of Norma's uh, husband Hank initially, who doesn't, who's sort of out of the picture, uh, and then because of Ed's wife Nadine, the two high school lovers appear destined to remain apart despite their enduring love for each other. When season three begins, actually, it initially appears as if uh, Ed and Norma are back together. So we see them sitting at a table together in the Double R Diner, and it, it looks like they're a couple. But then Walter Lawford arrives and kisses Norma, and it becomes apparent that Ed and Norma aren't a couple, and Ed goes sit somewhere else and I think has dinner with Bobby at that time. Um, Walter is a financier helping Norma create a series of diner franchises modeled on the Twin Peaks Double R original. While she seems satisfied with him, it's clear that some of his, her, his interest in her stems from the business potential of her diners. Early in the season, he points out that other franchises are more profitable than the original Double R Diner, a deficit due to the high costs and low prices at the original. He attempts to convince Norma to use cheaper ingredients and to charge more for the pies, ideas that cause Norma to bulk. Nonetheless, their romantic relationship seems unaffected by these business differences. The prospects for Ed and Norma finally becoming a couple seem pretty dim. But at the beginning of episode 15, 
events undergo a pretty dramatic turn. The episode starts with Nadine walking along the edge of the road carrying a golden shovel over her shoulder. I'm not going to show you that, but it's, it's pretty great. She walks miles from her home to Ed's gas farm, where Ed is in the process of pumping gas for a customer when she arrives. Shocked that she walked the distance rather than driving, Ed is puzzled by her presence. After telling her about her, after telling her, sorry, about telling him about her love for him, she confesses, this is a great line, I, I once had a not very pleasant girlfriend, and I, when I heard Nadine say this, I wanted, I dreamed in the past that my college girlfriend said this to me. But anyway, so <laughs> when, you, when I read it to you, you're going to be like, I can't believe he just said that. Um, she says this, I've been a selfish bitch to you all these years, <laughs> and you've been a saint. <laughs> she even, when I broke up with her, she said, you're a prick, I'm never going to talk to you again, so... It wasn't quite like that. Um, she even avows uh, her manipulation and use of guilt, guilt to coerce Ed to staying with Norma, I mean, to staying with her despite his love for Norma. Though Ed demurs initially, he eventually clearly knows that Nadine is finally telling him the truth. Nadine credits her awakening, I'm going to come back to the shovels, um, uh, to the webcast she's been watching created by Dr. Jacoby posing as Dr. Ant. Jacoby offers a, a blend of conspiracy theory and self-help that drives Jerry Horn into insanity, but actually has a beneficent effect on Nadine. For $29.99 plus shipping, Nadine buys one of the golden shovels that Jacoby hawks so that she can, as she says, shovel myself out of the shit. Just before she walks away, Nadine tells him that now he's free and that he should go and enjoy. Ed looks dumbfounded, but eventually does go to Norma in the diner. I think it's very significant that the prompt for Nadine's transformation originates in a conspiracy show and a spray-painted shovel from Jacoby. Though the change is genuine, it has a clear phantasmatic origin. Like what Jacoby's saying, some of it actually is not wrong, but a lot of it is just crazy uh, and typical kind of conspiracy thing. Um, but purchasing a sh- and also purchasing a golden shovel is certainly not the key to honesty. Yet in the case of Nadine, it does function as the instrument for her freedom from her own self-deception. By allowing Jacoby's program to seduce her, Nadine breaks from the reality that had governed her existence for 25 years. When Nadine grants Ed his freedom, he immediately goes to the Double R Diner to declare his love and availability to Norma. And this is my, I just have to say, my favorite scene of the the return, and now we're going to start. No, no. I've been loving you. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's so great, I think. Okay, so as Otis Redding's song, I've Been Loving You Too Long, plays, we see Ed drive up in the golden truck, matching the color of Nadine's shovel. Uh, and then when he enters, he waves joyfully, I'm just going to repeat what happened. Uh, he waves joyfully to Norma and walks to her, proclaiming, Norma, everything's changed. I spoke with Nadine. She's given me her freedom. She's given me her my freedom. Um, as he speaks, we see Walter walking toward the couple, Behind Ed, rather than instantly embracing him, Norma responds, Ed, I'm so sorry, Walter's here. Norma and Walter then walk to the table together, with Ed seemingly left in the lurch at the counter, where he orders the coffee and then under his breath, I like this part, the cyanide tablet. Lynch ends this interaction with a clear indication that Ed has waited too long and that Norma's involvement with Walter precludes their reunion. But this apparent rejection is not antithetical to the reunion. It's actually constitutive of it. So Norma and Ed reunite not by overcoming the past and establishing some kind of perfect complementarity. In order to enjoy the reunion of Ed and Norma, the spectator must first experience the lack at the heart of their relationship that Norma's initial seeming rejection indicates. Furthermore, Norma's conversation further establishes the logic of the subsequent relationship with Ed. After Norma seems to reject Ed in favor of Walter, she sits down to discuss the business, as you saw, with Walter. Through this discussion, Norma occasions a break with Walter, both fiscal and romantic, interestingly, uh, that creates the opening for her return to Ed. Over Walter's strenuous objections, she tells him that she will divest from the other franchises and focus her attention on the double R. This divestment from the process of accumulating capital puts off Walter, who just, it's unimaginable to him. And he angrily leaves and tells Norma she's making a grave mistake. And I find it fascinating that he walked, 
the time that he, from the time he's walking to the time he passes, it's far too long. So it's like, it's, it's, it's making us, and I'm, Lynch is not an idiot, so he clearly does this on purpose. And I think we're, we're like, when's Walter going to get out of there? And we're, we're forced to wait even longer than we're supposed to wait. Um, but it's the divestment in, in the franchise and the divestment in capital, I think, that makes it possible for her to proclaim her love for Ed and to accept his proposal. The show interposes this gesture of genuine divestment between Ed's initial proposal and Norma's acceptance, not just to generate suspense, although I think it does that, but also to indicate the contrast between accumulation and love. There's a gap in the love relationship, like the gap that separates Ed's declaration of love from Norma's acceptance of it. The genuine love relation is possible only when subjects involved, the subjects involved are not seeking out what will complete them, as one is when one accumulates. That's, I think, what the logic of accumulation, you want what will complete you. And this is why I think love and capitalism are fundamentally incompatible, despite the fact that you, it seems like they're not. It seems like capitalism is constantly selling love, but I don't think it really is. Um, the relationship between Ed and Norma becomes possible because Norma's gesture reveals an acceptance of a fundamental incompleteness or lack that the other characters are unable to avow. The most important contrast with Norma is Dale Cooper. Lynch includes this sequence of Norma and Ed's reunion not just to please devoted fans of the show, although clearly it did that, uh, but to illustrate an alternative to the path that Dale chooses. Although Dale is no arch-capitalist, I mean, he likes Tibet, <laughs> uh, uh, he commits himself fully to the project of eliminating loss completely by returning to the past to attempt to rescue Laura and by defeating the evil forces of Bob and Judy. What Lynch shows is that it is only through the acceptance of a fundamental loss that we can find a pathway to the satisfaction that we would otherwise overlook. The problem is that the series doesn't end with Norman Ed, but with Dale's attempted phantasmatic rescue of Laura Palmer. The problem doesn't lie in the turn to fantasy itself. Clearly, Norm, Norma and Ed are ensconced in a fantasy. But in the belief of a restored harmony contained within the fantasy. Even as Dale saves Laura from the phallic enjoyment of Bob, he leaves the enjoyment of, we might say the enjoyment of the drive signaled by Judy operative. His attempt to eliminate Judy has the effect of furthering the trauma that this drive dishes out rather than curtailing it as Dale intends. Subjectivity involves a repetition that we can't eliminate but have to comport ourselves toward. And I think the third season of Twin Peaks ends with the failure to do this, and that's its ultimate point. Thanks a lot. For